All right, CNT 120, Chapter 6, Wireless Communications. We're on the section now on channel management. Um, with wireless communications, there's different ways, different technologies used to broadcast data through that frequency band. Um, what often gets done is one of two technologies get used or some variation of either frequency hopping, spread spectrum, or direct, direct sequence spread spectrum. This allows multiple things to communicate across that frequency band, if you will. So, all right, CNT 120, Chapter 6, Wireless Communications. We're on the section now on channel management. Um, as we looked at earlier with our wireless technologies, the, the, the Bluetooth and the, um, and, and the other technologies we looked at, um, there's a band kind of allocated to these different technologies. Well, that band, to allow multiple devices to share that band, it's often divided into some channels. So our different technologies will use, or our different um, uh, wireless technologies will use different means to manage those channels. Two of the main ones are frequency hopping spread spectrum or direct sequence spread spectrum. Um, and these get typically get used or variations of these typically get used. So let's take a look at these real quick. Frequency hopping spread spectrum. What happens is a short burst of data is transmitted on a specific frequency in that band, and then it hops over to another frequency in that band and sends another burst, hops to a new frequency in that band and sends a burst. Um, and this literally can have happen hundreds of times a second. And the idea is if, if there is anything out there interference or noise-wise, as it's hopping, it's hopefully going to be hopping around that. Um, and if it does hop into that, you know, interference, it's for a short burst of time, and then it keeps going. Um, and then hopefully the receiver would ask for those pieces that were missing, if you will. So frequency hopping spread spectrum, as we as we look at time, it'll send a burst and then jump and burst and jump and burst and jump. Um, so it's hopefully avoiding spots of interference. And here shows, uh, I think, Bluetooth. I think they show this in the book as well. Bluetooth is going to be hopping around uh, different frequency bands. And it's actually going to try, in this case, to avoid this maybe full uh, channel uh, with lots of Wi-Fi signals. It's going to try to jump over that to avoid uh, that possible source of interference. Fun tidbit about frequency hopping spread spectrum. Uh, back in World War II, Hedy Lamarr, famous actress, um, she was a wonderful mathematician engineer as well, uh, developed a, a type of frequency hopping spread spectrum that got a, later got a patent for it um, that used a, a piano roll. If you've ever seen a piano that plays you know, music on its own, the early, form, the early form of that player piano used a roll, with, uh, roll of paper with punched holes in it. And every, every time the, the hole came through, it, it signaled play this note or play this, uh, play this sharp or this flat or whatever on the piano. Well, this technology, this frequency hopping spread spectrum technology uh, was developed using a pan of roll that jumped around 88 different frequencies and kind of uh, tried to communicate with uh, uh, radio guided torpedoes, etc. Um, and would try to jump around where there might be a source of interference. Um, and this was actually pretty huge in, in uh, communications for things in World War II. So pretty huge. It's a neat little tidbit if you're ever looking for a neat little tidbit for a speech or a research paper. The other technology, direct sequence spread spectrum, uh, the data stream is divided across the whole frequency band, if you will, uh, and sent as large large chunks. Um, so here it's taking, instead of just pieces and jumping around, it's actually kind of spreading it out all over the whole frequency band. Um, and the idea is it's trying to be a little more efficient with sending data through. Um, maybe pieces of this would have interference in, uh, but larger overall throughput uh, through that frequency, that through that frequency band. Here they showed kind of like what technologies tend to use. Wi-Fi tends to use direct sequence spread spectrum or variations of. Uh, Bluetooth tends to use frequency hopping spread spectrum. Zigbee tends to use direct sequence spread spectrum. Just so you can see that some of the some of the different technologies and what they use um, in the in this the 2.4 gigahertz band. 
All right, so as we deal with wireless communications, we also need to talk antennas real briefly. Um, again, remember, uh, with wireless communications, anything layer one and two, um, that is unique for wireless or wired. Those technologies, those uh, communication technologies, frames, etc., are all unique to wire or wireless. So layer three and above, IP, TCP, etc., all those things are gonna be identical, whether it's wired or wireless, so keep that in mind. The difference when we moved uh, from wired to wireless, well, wired, we had a fixed path. Um, we have a fixed path for our data to send. When we move to wireless, there is no fixed path. Um, it, it is going out through the air. So I need some way to focus that energy um, to get it from A to B. And that's where antennas come into play. That's where antennas come into play. So when we deal with antennas, um, we do need some kind of some kind of space that I'm going to get the signal from, you know, antenna A to antenna B or antenna on the access point to the antenna on my laptop, if you will. I need some sort of space or some sort of path that I'm going to get my signal. So when I talk antennas, we need to talk radiation patterns. How is this antenna broadcasting its signal, its, its, its energy? And there's two main types of antennas. There's either directional or omnidirectional. Directional, sometimes ca called unidirectional, it's going to focus its energy um, kind of along a path, trying to focus on almost like a flashlight. If you've ever had a flashlight that you can like turn the front of the flashlight into a focused beam, that's kind of what your directional antenna is doing. Um, it's not a direct beam like a laser pointer, uh, but if I take my flashlight and focus into a beam, more of my energy goes forward instead of out to the sides. Um, things like satellite TV would be an example of a directional antenna. That, that satellite TV antenna on your house has to be pointed at the satellite that is broadcasting that television signal. If it's pointed off to the side, it's not going to catch it. It won't, won't catch that energy. Meanwhile, an omnidirectional antenna is one that's broadcasting its energy um, in equal equal strength in equal directions. Now I'm putting little air quotes around that because it's not perfectly equal in all directions and all spaces. However, you think of it more of a balloon shape versus a, you know, a flashlight beam shape. It's trying to go out in a spherical shape. Things like TV and radio station antennas are going to do that. They're broadcasting in all directions. Anybody in that area would theoretically be able to pick up that signal. So as I look at antennas, here's a couple styles, um, and I can on some access points change those antenna styles for the, the purpose, the communication purpose I need, whether it's going across the whole building or going from building to building. So as I look at my antennas, there actually is what's called a radiation pattern. Uh, it's almost a graph showing you how is this energy being um How's this energy being transmitted? So if I look at something like a dipole on, this is our stereotypical uh, home router or home access point that a lot of us had. This dipole antenna is actually broadcasting out in kind of a, kind of like a squashed beach ball or a squashed uh, balloon shape. It's not perfectly round. It's kind of squashed a little bit more like a donut, but it's going out in 360 degrees. Um, that is your typical dipole pattern a radiation pattern from a dipole meanwhile something like a yagi antenna uh, i put this one up here because a lot of times if you go to like intersections where there's traffic lights you end up seeing this antenna on one of the po the poles up there this is going to be more of a directional it's trying to radiate its energy in in a more focused path trying to get back to the central office that is is receiving this telemetry this information if you will Fun side notes, you can actually construct uh, uh, directional antennas with things like old soup cans and old Pringle cans. Um, and the idea here is all the energy that will be focusing out in kind of that sphere or donut shape, you're taking and reflecting it all around and trying to focus it into a beam. Um, and even things like a Pringle can, if you go at the inside of a Pringle can, it's, it's a foil around the inside. That is going to focus the energy loosely into a beam. Now, these might look like a joke. Uh, they are not. If you do a little math, there is a little math you do on where this in, uh, where your uh, dipole, you kind of take apart your dipole and take the wire up and in. Um, where that goes in here 
does need to be measured and figured out for the frequency that you're sending. Uh, it matters if you put it here or back here. So there is a measurement you need to figure out. But this actually can focus the energy from that simple, you know, dipole or wireless antenna that you had to make it a directional antenna. Our wireless class a number of years ago, um, students constructed these and literally did a wireless connection across a large parking lot, uh, focusing these two Pringle cans at each other and made a wireless bridge from, you know, router to router, if you will, wireless router to wireless router, um, which is pretty slick. It's pretty cool. Uh, so there is there is actually all kinds of tutorials out there on making a can antenna um, with things like that. So fun little fun little side note on antennas. With antennas, I do need to worry about range, how much area is it going to cover. Uh, directional antennas are actually going to focus the energy greater, and you can get, you know, hundreds to thousands of feet um, between them. And like I said, our, our wireless class did this. Um, they also made uh, one where one of the guys was a welder, took aluminum pipe and welded a cap on the end and was able to make a really good directional antenna. Uh, and they were able to set up a wireless connection across uh, the Susquehanna River in Harrisburg, which can be almost a mile wide. Um, they made two of those aluminum pipes um, like this and then and then lined them up across the, uh, the river using a laser pointer and were able to get a wireless link across uh, that great distance. So it, it can be done um, with these directional antennas, even homemade directional antennas. We can actually calculate uh, the basically the effective... Um, the, the effective power from a, a antenna using this uh, effective isotropic uh, radiated power. Uh, this is actually a factor of a couple things. The factor of the, the output of the access point, the signal loss across the antenna cable, because the cable itself has a little bit of signal loss, and the, single gain, the signal gain from the antenna itself. So you can actually calculate that. Um, basically, the effective signal strength when I factor all those together in, in this little formula down here. It's a simple add-subtract formula, and that would give you basically the, the, the effective radi radiated power of that, um, that access point with a combination of those things that you put there. Well, the same thing can be done on the receiving end, on the antenna on your laptop, if you will. I can actually... Uh, get a factor of how good is this on the receiving end. Receive signal strength indicator. Uh, basically measures the, the, the strength of the signal on the receiver's end, on, on the laptop's end, if you will. Um, and this, this, the scale does manage, manage, uh, vary by manufacturer, but roughly the gist is this. If you have uh, uh, a negative 30, it's a really good signal. And as that number gets larger, your signal quality is getting worse. Uh, negative 50 is good. Negative 70 is acceptable. Negative 80, not so good. You're probably going to have connection issues. Negative 90 is pretty much not going to be able to get a, a connection. And some of us have encountered that. We try to connect to an access point maybe too far down the hall in a, in a hotel or something like that, or too far away when we're um, outside you know we're at the pool or something like that we're too far away from the access point in our house and we just can't get a signal or it'll connect but then it drops and it connects and it'll drop um that's what this is this is talking about the the signal strength at your device what is that rating okay when we talk about signal we also talk about propagation i think we'll come back in the next podcast and talk about propagation